Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Catholic Talk Show. Today, we're going to be talking about how to get the most out of the Catholic Mass. Yeah, we're going to look at some practical tips and some things that you could do the next time you attend Mass that'll help make it a more powerful and spiritual experience that draws you closer to Christ and our Lord. St. John Vianney said, if we really understood the Mass, we would die of joy. There's a lot to talk about, and there's a lot that we can actually gain from Mass, and most importantly is joy. Good to be back in the studio with you guys, Father and Ryan. How you guys doing? Ryan, doing good. Doing good. That's awesome. That's Absolutely. awesome. Yeah, really excited to get into this topic. We're going to be going through how to prepare, right? And right. then what to do or, how you know, how to approach Mass, I guess, spiritually, well, you practically. Know, you go to Mass week by week. Every week you go Sunday. And sometimes you can fall into a rut or, or a spiritual rut. It happens to mm -hmm. everybody. I mean, yeah. mm -hmm. it happens to saints. It happens to popes. It happens to the person next to you. And you know, we want to look at ways that you can reinvigorate uh, the experience of going to Mass so that when you are receiving our Lord in the Eucharist, that it is something that you're appreciating more and is having a deeper impact on your soul and you're allowing Christ to enter into you in a more powerful and complete way. With the misery of the world, I think the greatest reality that we hunger for is is happiness, man's search for happiness. And there's a distinction between happiness and joy, and happiness is very earthbound, and joy is very heavenbound. And it's our communion with the saints in Christ, with the Father, and receiving his affection, and living in the mystery of the Trinity, and, and really fulfilling our baptismal vows, that is the essence of our joy. And that is what is most evocative. And that's what St. John Vianney was discussing in relationship to what we can gain out of Mass. Mass is a celestial heavenly reality. We are in the heavenly company of all the angels and saints when we are worshiping at that altar. And that should overwhelm us with joy. But when we walk into the church with so much chaos and so much misery in our life, at times that could distract us from what's actually happening at the Mass. So yeah. we hope that this episode can help guide you from the very, very beginning in your preparation of what you do before you get to the church, what you do as you enter into the doorways of the church, how you sit down and receive the liturgy of the word, and then what you offer to the church at the altar, as well as receive from the altar the very body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus, and then blessing and commission and what you do after Mass. So we're hoping to scan all of that stuff in this, in this beautiful treatment of what we personally do, but also what the saints encourage as well. That's right. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, like you, you mentioned it, perfect distraction, you know, with six kids. It's obviously something that I experience. I'm also distracted sometimes by the liturgy um, and, and the, the approach of the liturgy, or maybe the reader's like, I can't hear them, or, you know, there's mm -hmm. like all these things going on. So uh, I'm hoping I get a lot out of this too as well. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> no, no. You said something important, and this is where I want to start with this episode, is that getting the most out of Mass does not start, start the second you sit down in the pew. It starts in the preparation before. It starts in your preparation weekly. It starts in the preparation the whole week leading up to Sunday Mass or Saturday Vigil, if you do that. Mm -hmm. Um, and preparation is important in everything and, and so much more so for the Mass. So how can we prepare ourselves for Mass so that when we actually do attend Mass in the celebration of the Eucharist, how is it going? How are we, how are we making ourselves a fertile ground for conversion and for communion with Christ? Well, the first things that you can do to prepare for Mass is obvious, and I think this is the most fundamental one that not enough people do that would make the biggest impact, and that is start regularly going to confession. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Confession is, is so important because within the liturgy, there's what's called a minor absolution. When we call to mind our sins, whenever we begin in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the Lord be with you and with your spirit, let us call to mind our sins and so prepare ourselves to celebrate these sacred mysteries. Mm -hmm. That's when we consider our sinfulness. That's when we consider our own personal misery. And we ask 
God for mercy. And then we hear the priest say, may Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. That's a minor absolution. That will cover any um, venial sins. You can you are getting absolution for venial sins mm-hmm. in that moment. But when it comes to mortal sins and things that are more grave and actions that deserve a greater treatment and conscientious effort of recognizing your sins, confessing them to the priest, receiving penance and absolution, you are making an effort to confess. And that is an important action in preparation because you are relieving and by negative grace, essentially, that grace takes away. What is grace taking away in that sense of theological negative grace? It's taking away that which prevents communion with others and communion with God. So, yeah, confession is so important. And whether you do that devotionally annually, you know, as as we are called to in canon law, or you do that more regularly, the most important thing is that you're doing it. But if you're sitting there thinking, I want more out of mass, then this is the way to do it. Mm-hmm. You you ought to go to confession regularly. For myself, yeah. I try to go every two weeks. Mm-hmm. When I when I push it to three or four weeks, I feel that effect on my soul yeah. and my and my very receptivity. Because, you know, our hearts get clogged up with sin and guilt and shame, and we we feel dark because maybe we didn't treat somebody right, and and that's left on our conscience. Well, we want to lay our conscience bare before our Savior, who washes us clean, renews our baptismal identity, reminds us that we are loved, and commissions us to greater freedom and reception of Holy Eucharist. Look, if you're having guests over for dinner, or even if you know that someone's coming over to look at your dryer or something like that, you're going to clean up your house because mm-hmm. you want to present your best foot forward. How much more important is it to really make sure that your place is in order before you invite the very king of the universe into your body? Yeah. I mean, it just, mm. look, if you're going to clean your house to have over the neighbors for dinner, you should do so much more for your soul for when you're going to be in true communion with yeah. our Lord. Yeah. And the, the uh, confession also gives you a, a clarity uh, of of God's uh, presence in your life too. I mean, it gives you something that um, removes a lot of debris, mm-hmm. right, and allows the flow of the Holy Spirit and and for Christ Himself to grasp graft Himself onto you. One of the things I was thinking about when you're talking about confession is there's not a lot of lines in confessions in churches these days. And, and I don't know why I'm kind of like, I'm on the fence. I think a lot of people really don't understand what they're receiving because it's like 70% don't understand what they're receiving when they receive the Eucharist, which is kind of a big deal because that's like the source and summit of all of, of what God has for us. But like, what have you, like, I mean, I'm sure people have come back to church and you've counseled people, like, what do you see out there in terms of people shying away from confession as a spiritual practice? Well, a lot of people don't want to, uh, you know, confess to another human being. They mm-hmm. say, I confess to Jesus, I confess to my God, and that's and that's it. You know, that's that's all that's needed. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I always open up the scripture and, and I, I speak about, you know, this is Jesus clearly giving the very authority to over every unclean spirit and giving the faculty of the forgiveness of sins to the apostles very, very clearly. And that's been passed down in succession from generation to generation. Jesus continues to commission his priests for this one particular service in relationship to reconciliation. And, and there's greater st- reasons for this because mm-hmm. not only do I stand in persona Christi absolving sins, but I also stand in persona of the community that is offended as well. So there is an offense against God, yes, that, that needs to be atoned for and you need to have forgiveness. But there's also an offense of uh, to the human family that was occurred. And I stand on behalf of the human family as well to offer forgiveness. So mm. there's a double element to that, that sense of how we approach the sacrament of reconciliation and why we are confessing. Yeah. Per- personally, I, I've, I've had an encounter with a priest that, um, I went to confession like once a month and, uh, and, and he's like, go, go as much as you can, like at least once a week. And I I kept thinking to myself, like I confess, sometimes I confess the same thing and I feel like I should be better than that. Mm -hmm. You know, do you ever Mm -hmm. hear people frustrated about their sin Mm -hmm. out of love for God and and that holding them back Mm -hmm. from 
confession? You know, I, I would I would relate it probably to what Sheila was sharing before. It's like, you know, when we go outside, we're going to get dirty. We're going to mm-hmm. get sweaty. We're going to get stinky. And, and mm-hmm. it's like, you know, we need to be able to take a shower. You know, mm-hmm. that's essentially what it is. We, yeah. we're, we're being cleansed. And it's not something we should avoid. You know, it, it's something that should be refreshing. Yeah, yeah, don't be the stinky kid. Yeah, don't be. <laughs> what's that, enough of those. What's pig that pen. kid for pig, yeah, pig pen? pen. <laughs> you just read my mind. A bunch of spiritual pig pens right now. Yeah. <laughs> Presenting yourself to Jesus, you know what I mean? Yeah, when I, you know, I, I remember I went into a guy's house. He, he was very, very sick, and I was visiting him regularly, weekly, bringing him holy communion and this is when i was a youth minister he was one of the kids in the youth group's dad and um you know he had very very low energy and and he was constantly on medication and his emotions were up and down well this one day i came in and and he's had me sit down and on the couch and he says i'll be right back and he comes out and he takes off his shirt he just had an undershirt on and he, he wrapped a towel around his waist and he and he knelt down and he took out a tub of water and soap and he said, I want to wash your feet. And I said, no, man, like, I'm here to wash your feet. I'm here. I'm here in service to you. And he said, no, I need to do this for you. That's the same thing the apostles said when Jesus tried to wash their feet. I, I know. And, and I, I sat there and I mean, he dipped my feet in like some hot water and then some Epsom salt. I, he like he scrubbed my feet, dude. He gave you a pedicure. Like he scrubbed my feet, and and those some nasty piggies. I've got that. some nasty piggies. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, as he's scrubbing, and like he, it was so quiet and so silent, and it was so moving that afterwards, my heart was just completely wide open, and we had one of the most beautiful moments of fellowship in my life, opening up the scripture. And then receiving the Eucharist, you know, in this beautiful uh, communion rite to the sick. And that is precisely what confession ought to do. You go outside, your feet get dirty, your body gets dirty, and it's all about washing. Don't feel bad that you go outside and you get dirty in the same manner. Yeah. That's just life. Like, yeah. we, we all have environments that we get into that we get dirty from. Yeah. And the whole idea is that you are cleaning yourself in preparation for the banquet and you need to be properly clothed and you need to be properly prepared. And one of those preparations of the many, before we start talking about the clothing (laughs) is you need to be clean. So wash yourself. Right now, some other things to prepare for mass so you can get the most out of mass. And I'll, I'll lump these all together. So we just generally discuss them is you should be number one, observing the fast before mass. It really is important. You should be preparing for the, the liturgy of the word by reading the scriptures ahead of time. You have a whole week to prepare. It'll only take you two minutes, three minutes. Read them and start contextualizing them and start being prepared for how you are going to be nourished on them at the Mass. And then also make sure that during the week you are continually in prayer so that you're not, you know, if you only go to the gym once a week, that that is not going to get the most out of it. So if you're praying daily and your prayer life is you know, robust, when you show up to Mass on Sunday, it's not going to be a shock to your system. Right. So fasting. Less distractions, too, I think. Fasting, prayer, and and reading the scriptures ahead of time are three other things you could do to prepare for Mass. Mm-hmm. So you know? fasting is, <clears throat> an, um, is it an hour? It's an hour before Mass starts, right? Is that the... This is, this is where I like to go back to the tradition mm-hmm. of what has been the practice uh, for a greater majority of of you know, the church's teachings as well as why, why we ought to fast. So even like from, from some, you know, when, when you go to bed to the time you wake up, you're not eating anything before you go to church from the time you wake up. That was the original practice. I mean, that's where, that's where the breakfast, yeah, that's where the word breakfast comes yeah. from. You're breaking, you, your you're fast. breaking. For, yeah, exactly. So you're fasting all the way up because you're hungering for the Eucharist. Mm-hmm. But what I like to encourage people, especially my RCIA candidates and, and catechumens, is, you know, hey, why, why would we fast? Don't, you want to you anticipate that meal. You want to hunger for what can truly satisfy. Yeah, you don't stop at McDonald's on your way to Morton's. Mm-hmm. You don't do it, right? Yeah. You're, you're, you're saving your appetite for something of a higher nature yep. a greater a greater meal right. that that you know its taste is far superior 
than, you know, like McDonald's to a nice steak. Right. It, it's far superior. We're talking about the, bone and the bread of angels. Like we're talking about mm. the bread of angels. We should hunger for that. But yeah. not only not only hungering in, in stomach, you know, and our belly could become our God. Physically. But we should also fast from our music, fast from, you know, visual stimulation. We should fast from <coughs> physiological stimulation. Before we go to mass, when you say physiological, do you mean like our body? So, out yeah, or? Well, like even like discipline over the flesh, like even in, in sense of working out would be great. But think of pleasures of the flesh, mm-hmm. you know, like abstaining from pleasures of the flesh before you go to mass. If you are if you are restricting and disciplining all of your senses by fasting from things that you are, are pleasured by, you're going to get more out of mass. That's a deeper yeah. sense of the of what most people would take fasting to be, and I right. I think that's really great. Well, mm-hmm. we, we had this thing in the seminary. It was kind of funny. It was kind of like a running joke. <clears throat> We'd all wake up. I mean, we went to mass, what, every day, right, I think? And uh, <laughs> every day, I don't know. I, 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 mean, I, mean, I think I'm supposed to be there. Ago. I mean, like, what? Uh, Maybe you did. It uh, uh, <laughs> I was sleeping in. No, but, like, we would, there would be coffee on, and, uh, and, and, you know, I, I, I drink coffee in the morning. It, it literally activates my brain in a way that's like, I love. And, uh, and I, I feel, I felt like in the seminary, like I needed to activate my brain to be more present to the Lord. And so a lot of the guys that we were just talking about, like, this is, I don't know about fasting. Like, you know what I mean? It was just kind of a thing where we were talking about like, yeah, this is coffee, you know, just yeah, you're drink allowed to have coffee before just drink it black. That's what I always heard. If you drink coffee black, you're, you're not breaking your fast. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If, I don't know. I mean, that's, it seems like a technicality to me, but I didn't take yeah. pleasure in it. It was just me waking up. <laughs> it's going to help me be more alert yeah. at mass and pay closer attention. You know, if there's something that's going to help you pay attention, yeah. do it. Right. Yeah. So yeah, you want to fast your eyes, well, but do you fast, do you within fast limits? Do you fast your, you know, from visually, do you fast from looking at the readings and reading them before no. mass? No, oh. but should you fast from ESPN? Uh, yeah, yeah. Probably. Yeah. You know, when it comes to, uh, you know, your preparation for, if I'm drinking and I'm tasting bitter coffee and I'm not loading it up with sugar and milk and all yeah, this other stuff. Don't go pumping rails of Adderall. Well, what, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what about like the uh, Folgers cup, you know? Oh, yeah, man. <laughs> I kind of want a cup of coffee right now. Yeah. Um, but no, like things that help you focus, things that are going to prepare you for mass. Those are the occupations that you need to be doing leading up to mass. Yeah. And, you know, so many people say, oh, I get nothing out of the mass. Well, what do you mean? What are you putting into it? What you, and, but then it's I like, well, wait, well, the homily, you know, I don't get anything out of the I homily. I hear that a lot. I hear that all the time. Yeah, because well, you're a bad homily. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That was bad. Oh, I'll, give wow. you, I'll give you some of that. That was too. a softball. That was, that that was, was a softball. Knocked out Howard, of the park. Howard, please get the fire department on because we just had a massive third degree burn. <laughs> <laughs> If the if people were reading the scriptures, prayerfully meditating through Alexio Divina, and then possibly even looking at commentaries and what saints have said about these different yeah. scriptures, you are going to benefit so much more tremendously. Then you, when you're listening to the priest, he may add something, he may contribute something. It may not be the most amazing homily. I'm sorry. You may not understand what he's saying, and, and, and that's look, okay. Yeah, week, weekday masses with no homily, they're fantastic. Yeah. Look, the scripture's still there. You don't have to have the homily. And if you're not, if you're only going there to get the entertainment of an excellent homilist, you're missing out a lot of what yeah. the mass should be about. I, I'd also like to to dive a little bit more into scripture because it is so important, the God's word and how you would prepare for something like that. There's this app that um, that they sponsored our show and it's called Hallow. And we'll talk about that a bit later, but um, they do <coughs> Lexio Divina for the readings mm-hmm. And it's great. It's That's just a good, the gospel. It's, really good it's the gospel. And, and, and the guy like directly, um, like takes you through this meditation yeah. and this prayer. And it's helped me a lot to be able to like consume the word and actually have it like planted in my soul. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's also what, what other ways can people like, 
uh, engage with scripture to uh, help them to f- to digest this, right? A big, a big shout out to the MPG, the men's prayer group in San Diego that I was a part of. We would get together every week yeah. and we would crack open the scriptures for the upcoming weekend and we would read them and we'd take a moment of silence and then we'd go to the responsorial psalm, we go to the second reading, we go to the gospel and we would read through it and then we'd take a moment and then people would start sharing like, this is what really stood out for me. This yeah. is what really, and then we start to reinforce each other with our own perspectives. Yeah. And then somebody who is more properly trained and has, you know, some commentaries that they've looked at and they've researched and prepared themselves, then they could present more substantive material. Mm-hmm. And that is, that is a phenomenal way to do it in community mm-hmm. with your brothers or sisters, or maybe you do it with families. You a, a group of families get together, open up the scripture, discuss it. Those types of situations would be a wonderful way, but there are so many other applications out there and web resources. St. Louis University puts out a phenomenal approach to every single weekend's liturgy, and they go into depth in relationship to the church fathers, perspectives, reflections from all these different priests and religious men and women throughout history. It's Excellent. I love that's one of my so, favorite resources. So they so you would read the scripture and then you would pick up this commentary yes. and read that in conjunction with it. Yeah, yes. look, if you could prepare for the Sunday <clears throat> football game and you know who's playing, what the injury report that's is, what point. the matchups are, you can get the You go lines. get your Tostitos you and could, your yeah, chips. If you could prepare for that and you could read the articles, you know, telling you what the, you know, cornerback wide receiver matchup is, you could you Ooh. could take time to do that. Yeah, and you said in another episode that that a lot of people don't show up or when in a conversation, a lot of people don't show up when the home team's in town. Yeah. So it happens I mean, all that's, the time. yeah, so, but that's not like, that's not knowing what you're receiving yeah. literally because when you start to compare, it's you know, just not even the close. Jags or the chiefs or the, you know, God help us Browns. Definitely not the Browns. Oh, but gosh. when Everybody's you start weigh, weighing that in relationship to the bread of life, yeah. it's not yeah. the word of life, yeah. you know, and, and our com- communion and our fellowship at the level of the heart and worship, mm. you know, there's no comparison. Yeah. And what you can draw out of the mass for your week is so much more valuable than a win or a loss Mm -hmm. from your local team. So some other things, I think the last thing to prepare for mass before we actually start saying what you can do at mass is, and this we can talk about this briefly. don't have to get too deep into it. Is that look, if you're going to the, if you're going to a bar or if you're going out to eat, you're going to get dressed up. If you're going to meet people, you're going to get dressed up. You're not going to show up. You're going to take pride and put thought into what you're wearing. You should do that going to Mass. No one says you have to put on a three-piece suit and a cummerbund with tails and a top hat. You don't have to do that. It's not even feasible. It'd be great. But you don't have to do that. But putting thought into it. And that's not to say be ostentatious or pretentious about what you're wearing. But giving dignity to yourself and putting yourself... You know, they always say dress for the job you want, right? Or dress for the situation, Dress for the situation in the mass because the way you'd clothe yourself is going to impact the way that you're feeling about yourself. And if you are making this a special moment, even if it's not elaborate or fancy or expensive clothes, but if you're putting the time into thinking, thinking about what about you're wearing, it, yeah. it's going to help prepare you for mass because even the same way that priests will put on liturgical vestments, there is a reason for it. And it's a preparatory tool so that you are setting this time apart by the way you are dressing, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Again, yeah. and and I think using using the analogies that you're already throwing out there, you know, if you are going to get dressed to go to a wedding in a particular way, right. you know, that's what's happening at mass. Mm-hmm. It's it's the groom pursuing his bride, like yeah. the bridegroom Jesus Christ is pursuing his bride, us, mm-hmm. and it, it is a wedding banquet, and. That's important to, to get a sense of because how am I prepared, how am I dressed, and how am I clean for this for this celebration? Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's um yeah that's that's a uh, that's one for me that it's uh, a simple thing. I confess I I'm not as I mean I dress nice but like with my kids and stuff like that and uh, you know trying to get that going I I think Put I it could, out the night before you know plan well yeah and I think I can be more deliberate and and get them you know, clothes that, I mean, my daughters dress really pretty with the dresses and, but the boys, you know, I could probably the, the, do a the little boys, better with. Look, the boys, kids can get some leniency. 
yourself. Yeah. Do a little preparation for yourself. You yeah. Know? yeah. Because that's going to educate the children. It is. Yeah. You know, and, and they're they, going to remember. When they can control what they will dress. Yeah. Like, Dad always used to make sure that at least, you know, it didn't have mustard mm-hmm. on his shirt. Gotcha. Yeah. There was, you know, there was a guy that I knew that lost his job, an old timer. And he would wake up every mm-hmm. day and he would put on his suit. He'd put on his tie. He would go down to the corner, buy his newspaper, shake hands, talk with people along the way. Go back, sit at his table, have his coffee, read his newspaper in a complete suit because of the dignity mm-hmm. of his life, even mm-hmm. though he didn't have a job and his value, all that stuff. It was like he had to wake up. And psychologically, what that does for you yeah. is tremendous. It, yeah. it really is. It's absolutely tremendous. Yeah. And the way that people interact with you, they interact with you with, with greater sincerity and seriousness, mm-hmm. not, not because of any pretension. No, because... You are upholding yourself with dignity. Well, it's yeah. respect of the other person, too, that you're presenting themselves. You have the respect for other people to care enough about presenting yourself in a certain way. So. Yeah. My ushers at, at my home parish, and they the nines. look so, yeah. sharp. All yeah. the Shop. ushers, man. All the old Knights of Columbus oh, ushers. man. They look yeah. great. Man, yeah. they got the tie clips. Oh, yeah. And the, yeah. 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 No, it's, it's the great. Do-rags. <laughs> the do-rags. The <laughs> do-rags. All right. So... <laughs> Now, now let's talk about what you can actually do once you enter the well, church. Well, no, well, before we get into that, um, St. Faustina would recommend uh, at least an hour of silence before Mass. So even the product the product that comes out of silence is an appetitive response, like I am hungering for something. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you think about it, when you clear your mind in silence, you're ready to receive something. Yeah. So right when you get into Mass— you know, having that silence is so important so that when it begins, your focus is you're receiving everything. And a lot of that you see with people kneeling down before mm-hmm. mass starts, getting there a little bit early, praying a rosary, yeah. you know, just really uh, immersing yourself in in receiving, mm-hmm. right? And not getting or mm-hmm. d- doing or, you know, it's just really just kind of contemplation. Like, let me enter into the social yeah. hour before mass right. and, Another and talk thing with too, Like when I'm late, I, I do an examination of conscious in, in my, in my car. And I'm like, what am I, what am I bringing you Lord? Like, where are my joys? Where am I? And we will talk a little bit more about mm-hmm. that. Um, a little later, but you know, it's also the preparation in that silence of what, what, what do I want to give you mm-hmm. and, and going through your week. Mm-hmm. And going through your interactions with people, and going through your hopes, going through your your failures. Yeah, what do you bring with you to mass? Yeah, inter- internally in your soul, right. mm-hmm. and that, that's what they call examination mm-hmm. of conscience, right? Is that what uh, yeah? And, but and then also, like, what are you like literally bringing right. to the church? So, yeah. are you bringing food for the poor? Are you bringing clothes for the poor? Are you bringing yeah. money for tithing? Are you bringing, are you bringing your, your sufferings and your, your pain? sufferings, your yeah. pain? Are Are you bringing your children? Are you yeah. bringing your wife? Are you bringing your friends? Are you Enjoy bringing the guy your participation in, your, in in your neighborhood that's really Really, really uh, struggling, and he just—he's looking for a friend. Hey, come with me to mass. We'll go uh, out for breakfast afterwards. Uh, we'll spend half a day together. You know, you're not alone in what you're suffering. Yeah. That's what you're bringing. Mm. You know, and we should be evaluating what are we bringing mm-hmm. to church. Yeah. Right. You know, that's a very good point. Now, I guess we hear. You know, this is a good place to take a break. Why don't you tell everyone about our sponsors? I'd be happy to. We are most grateful for our sponsors. And I have to first start with Hallow. Hallow is the number one Catholic meditation and guided prayer application in the App Store today. Be sure to visit Hallow because when you do, you'll see all sorts of prayer and meditation guided efforts that they have put together in a beautiful and most attractive way. From Teze to Lexio Divina to Rosary and to daily gospel reflections and so much more. This is a beautiful application that you should definitely have on your phone. And if you utilize this platform, you will truly be able to advance in not only your understanding of the Catholic tradition of prayer, but be able to cultivate that in your own practice uniquely to you. This number one Catholic meditation and prayer app is specifically out there for you to grow in your faith. We are so grateful for their work. We are so grateful for their sponsorship. And you should take a moment and check them out because they are truly at the very forefront of technological advancement and the new evangelization. So check out Hallow Catholic Meditations and Prayer App today. We want to tell you about our sponsor, Exodus 90. 
Exodus 90 is 90 days of prayer and asceticism, cold showers and devout prayer moving through the book of Exodus so that men could find greater freedom in Christ. This program is a tremendous program that over 20,000 men have already gone through, and you should consider becoming the very next member in this very powerful movement. Please consider to join Exodus 90 now. Check them out. You will not regret it. Ave Maria University, our sponsor, is an institution of higher learning in the Catholic tradition, and one that is very, very dear to me, as I am an alumnus and a graduate of 2008 from the new campus. We were part of the first graduating class, and it is awesome to see how much Ave Maria University has grown and has become not only the youngest Catholic institution, but one of the most powerful, driven in academics and faith. It is a university that appeals to all. And we'd like you to consider becoming a student at Ave Maria University, or if you know someone that is of age that may be looking at colleges and universities around the country, be sure to tell them about Ave Maria. There are over 30 majors. There's programs undergrad as well as postgrad, all the way up to PhDs in theology. You do not want to miss a chance to attend this university. It is surrounded by the oratory, this beautiful church in the middle of Ave Maria town, just 30 miles away from Naples and the beautiful beaches. It's in Southwest Florida. So the weather is beautiful, but the greatest thing and the most beautiful thing about the university is the community. The community life is a place where young people find belonging and most importantly, encounter Christ in the beautiful tradition of the Catholic faith. So check out Ave Maria university today. You won't regret it. All right. Thank you for that Padre. Uh, uh, definitely go check all those uh, resources out. Now, walking into Mass, we already talked about the preparation, but getting into Mass and you're actually walking into the actual structure of the church, what can we start doing to get more out of Mass there? The first thing that you can do, and I'll, I'll put these two things together. Um, number one, make sure that you're identifying where the tabernacle is and making sure that you are preparing yourself to reverence the, our Lord in the sacrament in the tabernacle when you're entering the church, but also... Make sure you're blessing yourself with holy water. And when you do, you know, it's it can become so habitual. You just come mm -hmm. in, yeah. Father Hun, and right, and you're done, right? But really, why are we doing that? Why are we blessing ourselves with holy water? We're trying to recall our baptism and our uh, entrance into new life and our washing away of original sin. And it can be something that's so easily overlooked that, well, it's holy water. It's just something you do. Really, every time, recall your baptism, recall that you are in this church and called to a new life and that you've died to sin every time. <clears throat> and your baptismal promises. Exactly. And recall those and it will make a difference in what the rest of this experience is going to be like. Mm. It's renewal. I, I used to go into the church when I was really just fresh out of my, my reversion and I would make the sign of the cross and then I would dip my hands back in the holy water. Touch my eyes, touch my senses, and and just ask God to to. That's renew. a great way to get pink eye. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> or give other people pink eye. Thank goodness we put drops of bleach into the uh, <laughs> into the water to clean it out. But no, just to to do that because it was just a devotional thing, and I loved it because it made me really appreciate. Okay, I want to be cleansed walking in here. I want my baptism to be renewed. And I want to be open with all of my senses, my whole being to God in this celebration so that I could truly get the most out of this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So also when you're walking in and you're finding your seat, you know, sit up close to the front. Catholics are notorious for trying to sit as far back as they possibly can. Sit up front, participate, <laughs> don't hide. You're not hiding from it's all. It's better for my kids too. I mean, even though sometimes we have to carry them out, but like I, like when we sit in the back, like they can't see. Right. Mm -hmm. If we sit in the front, they can see they're way more engaged, way yeah. more engaged. We sit next to people. These are your people. This is your yeah. community. Sit next to them. Sure. Move around. Don't always sit in the same spot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Get to, you know, um, but when you get into that seat, you know, make sure that you're genuflecting to the altar and kneeling to the tabernacle. But when you get in that seat, start saying some mm -hmm. prayers before mass. Be quiet. Don't use this as a time to start making your plans for afterwards. Mm. We really use that time in preparation. And Pope Francis, to his credit, this is one of the things that he's really been on and on about during his pontificate is less talking, less noise, less distraction before Mass in preparation and also in deference to other people who are trying to prepare. Mm -hmm. um, very important. And, and it's not time to read the bulletin either. 
And, you know, a number of parishes have the practice of handing out the bulletin before Mass. It's not time to read the bulletin. Mine only after Mass. Yeah, yeah. that's that's how I, 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 that was one thing that I've changed. But, you know, it's important to sit down, focus, be silent, and open yourself up and get to know where the readings are in the hymnal, where, you know, can you find the, the, um, the scriptures for the Mass. Mm-hmm. And then begin to prepare yourself. Just refresh and then sit there. And you could pray a, a decade of the rosary. You could pray the rosary before Mass. You could do a lot of other different devotionals. But I find that silence is the best, you know, really developing that inner quiet um, and receptivity. Yeah. And for and for kids, you know, it's, it's always like, hey, this is what daddy's doing right now. Why don't you join me in silence as we prepare? Think about this. Think about some people we can pray for. Oh, yeah. Remember this person we prayed mm-hmm. for this week? We're going to pray for him again. Like we're putting stuff on the altar so the guy can can help us. You know? Excellent. Yeah, I mean, and look, if you have your little book of Catholic prayers, there's going to be a prayer before Mass. Find some that you like. I know Aquinas wrote a great one. He did. Ambrose. Yeah. yeah. There's, there's a lot of awesome prayers written yeah. by saints before Mass. <clears throat> They're in the um, book too, right? Yeah, they're, they're in the they're in the missile, but they're also if you go to iBrevery, you know, and and download the app iBrevery, there's they're all in that uh, in that application. I and, would encourage people to get the book though. Yeah, it's special. You can keep your holy cards in there. You're not distracted with your phone. It doesn't allow you to leave your phone yeah. on iBrevery. And these apps are awesome. Mm. And if you want to use them during mass, I would just recommend getting a book. It's better having a breviary. It's yeah. better having it's better having a you know a missile or or yeah. some type of a phone you know, distraction. Fall. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. If you shut it off, I mean, I've I've used I've used my phone a it's lot. Hard I still to be use my phone with in the, it. Yeah, you know, I still use my phone a lot, and and I will shut off my you know I'll put it in airplane mode mm. um, when I don't want to be distracted or messaged while I'm praying. Mm-hmm. But uh, no, it's much better. There's no comparison. All right. So now mass is about to start now. Really, you know, there's so many different ways that you can really deeply participate in in the, in the mass, right? You can you can try to um, make sure that you are sincerely responding when you are when there's when you're saying the creed, proclaim it. Don't just don't just out of habit respond. I mean, you're proclaiming what your faith is. Proclaim it boldly and proudly, and with your heart. Mm-hmm. You know. They, uh, they, it's always said that, you know, a sincere prayer with your whole heart is better than a hundred Hail Marys, right? Mm-hmm. And it's the same thing. If you're really internalizing and proclaiming your faith in the creed or in the preparation and the prayers or in the, the penitential act and you're really meaning it, you are going to just try, try to focus on really the words and get the most out of them like that. God desires a contrite heart. Put plain and simple from the scriptures, he, de- he desires contrition in our heart and for us to be intentional about the readings. When you say, thanks be to God, you're saying thanks be to God because you've received something from God in that reading. And we're saying that together. Responsorial Psalm. Sing the Responsorial Psalm. Even if you don't have a fantastic voice, participate because it lifts your spirit because you're singing to God. And, you know, exactly what you're saying, when you when you get to the gospel, we're standing in reverence and reception for the gospel that's being proclaimed in, in Jesus. Like, receive that. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. You know, when, when you, you hear the gospel of the Lord, praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ, because I would not be able to live this life without your words. Your words mean so much to me. Mm-hmm. So praise to you. That, that's what we want to get into at, at the level of the heart. And then when we proclaim the creed, you know, and, and then enter into the preparation of the altar and the offerings that we make of our gifts to God for how benevolent he's been to us. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I, uh, I got some work to do. On that. Uh, but uh, no, and we all do because we bring yeah. our imperfections to the or like in the confidior. Yeah. Really just like really you're, you're, you're bringing it all like. It's so easy to go Is to that mass. Lord have mercy, continue. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, I, oh, okay. I, it's so easy to go to mass and you know the parts. You've done it hundreds of times. It's so easy to just go through them automatically. Oh. But if you really just try to reconnect with them and look at the meaning, or maybe even prepare and and look at the order of the mass and why things are said, and when you are saying them, 
actually proclaim them. Don't say them. Yeah. It, it'll change your experience to where it's like, I've done this a hundred times. Yeah. But it's different. You know, that's, it's different. That's why the disposition, in my opinion, what's been very helpful and fruitful for me is the disposition of the examination of my conscience and bringing things to the altar. And it's all the joys in my life, all the suffering, all the things in petition that I'm asking him for, um, all these things, you know, the, 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 the people who have passed away in my life that I pray for, like all this stuff brings to the altar helps me to frame what I'm doing during the mass and, and, and hopefully be able to, to engage mm -hmm. further. Mm -hmm. I know sometimes one of the things that I do that I don't like about myself is when we get to the petitions, I kind of start zoning at Lord, hear a prayer, Lord, hear a prayer. Uh, for our bishops and all of our leaders, Lord, hear a prayer. And I'm, uh, I'm not like really saying prayers. All yeah, the and, and I'm not engaging. And, and for and, and a so lot and of, so who this mass is offers for, Lord, hear a prayer. A lot of the universal prayers just so drawn out, though, like, and they're written so long. And, and you know, people try to be poetic or whatever. That's why I told my deacon, I just said, listen, when you prepare, just just say, we pray for our Holy Father, Pope Francis. We pray for Bishop Estevez. Mm. We pray for the sick, those in the hospital. Mm -hmm. We pray for those who are terminally ill, facing death. Yeah. I, At least it's like, it, it, it helps me because my brain's all over the place. Yeah. It helps me focus. Okay, this is what we're praying for. You should do... Pray for Pope Francis, huh? Hey, eh? eh? Pope for the <laughs> pray for the Pope. Eh? 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 Pray for Ryan Delacruz, huh? Do it, do it. But I mean, like, and then and then it'll hit me just moments after. It's like, and for who this mass was offered, I didn't even hear the name. And this is typically someone who's deceased, and they, this is how I can connect to them, and. Mm -hmm how grateful they would be that I actually prayed sincerely for them. And I don't, and I'm like, I am a terrible person. I always for that. wonder when I, when I don't, when I do what you're talking about, I always wonder if just being present there and saying it is enough because it's the prayer of the church. Well, it's like, not, is it my uh, prayer? Is mm -hmm. it like, but you are the, the church's church. prayer, right? But you're but, participating in it. But, but yeah, like how, you know, I, sometimes when I don't listen to anyone, I'm like, God, hey, you know, I didn't listen to these prayers, but I'm <laughs> offering them to but, you, you know, for look, what I did not hear. It's it's, <laughs> it's, bene it's beneficial. Is it more beneficial if you're more sincere and more Probably. focused? Yes. Yeah, I maybe, can only yeah. imagine. I'm, yeah, not, sure. I'm not a theologian. Yeah. It's it's all about sincerity and yeah. contrition of heart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, the more that you are present, the more it's it, it, when we really present our prayers together. Yeah. yeah. Becomes very, very powerful. So then you've got. What the word? Where are we? Well, we're at offertory, and then offertory. you know what you're bringing to the altar, what you're tithing yeah. from from yeah. what you what you've made to give mm -hmm. back to God. Right, because some of the times the best ways to get things out of church is to out of mass is to give more to mm -hmm. mass. You mm -hmm. know, yeah. the and more that's you where give, liturgia comes from. The work of the people is this is work. We're we're lifting up our voice. We're singing. We're actively participating. Mm -hmm. We're ushering. We're lecturing. We're doing things that that shows our participation. It's our work to praise God, to worship him. Mm -hmm. And, th and that's how, that's how Jesus has accomplished it. It was his work that drew us into this liturgy. Absolutely. And look, sometimes look, you can't get more into your hands. Your hands are finite spaces. Your heart and your soul are finite spaces. Sometimes emptying those out by giving away allows you to receive more mm -hmm. and making sure that you are, giving of your time, giving of your prayer, giving of your wealth, giving of your poverty, giving of your pain, of your suffering, of your joy, and really uniting all that you have and are in in thanksgiving and sacrifice to the mass and intentionally doing it. It's so easy to just, you know, yeah. drop the envelope in and move on with your life, but it, it matters. And mm -hmm. thinking about why you're doing that, thinking about how your contribution is impacting the church. It's helping the parish. It's helping the people in need. It's perpetuating this institution that is our safety net on earth. I mean, it means and, something. And that's the beauty of offering. So you you offer, now you have your hands open, and Can you, you do have that your heart dramatically? open. Offering. Thank you. So you offer all of this, and you offer the gifts of bread and wine, and they come up in procession to the altar, and what does God give you in return? He gives you perfect communion with your brothers and sisters and perfect communion with God in the person of Jesus Christ and receiving his resurrected body. Mm -hmm. So in, in that full procession to this very moment, 
and and focusing, and this is just kind of a, a little point, but when the priest is upholding the sacrament and he's saying, behold the Lamb of God, or take this, eat it, take this, drink it, it's it, it calls for our attention. Like we should be looking at the host. That's why I love the bells, the Santus bells, mm-hmm. because no, if you are if you're in just that kind of daze or you're losing attention, those bells. I mean, it's Pavlovian. It, it draws your attention, mm-hmm. and <laughs> it's it's hard it's not true. to say, "Oh, this is what I'm supposed to be mm-hmm. doing." That's why it's just one of those things. It's so easy to do in churches. Have the bells, you know? Yeah, no, it's true. Um, and then down to the point of reception of Holy Communion. When you're when you're there, that's why I would really love to have communion rails back. When you could, you know, you could kneel and wait, and then then the blessed sacrament, the body of Christ, Amen. It's like expectation. It's like that expectation. Yeah. You're waiting. You're focused. But as best as you can, in processional lines or however you do it in custom in your parish, it's like you know, be conscious that you're moving closer and closer and closer to receive Eucharist with your brothers and sisters and form that fellowship and that intimate connection with Jesus as He fills your soul with His very self. I always try to envision. Calvary, and I always try to envision the actual crucifixion in a historical sense when I'm walking up to receive, and I try to place myself in that moment, Mm -hmm. and I try to place myself in what would I say if I could walk up to the foot of the cross at that moment with our Lord suffering and being crucified for our sins? What would I say to him? And I try to use that walk to communion as my own personal Calvary in Mm -hmm. that moment, and what am I bringing up that hill? What am Mm -hmm. I bringing to the foot of the cross? Before I receive that back, and if I'm if I'm going to be offering my communion for a particular intention or a person or for the help I need, that's one thing that I to me, and there, I don't think I don't know if there's any precedent for that, but for me, it's something that I've done for that's a, a long beautiful time. Devotion, man, yeah. But I and putting myself in that very real historical moment. Number one, it lets me know that this is truly the body and blood of Christ given up for us, but it also contextualizes that this is the unbloody representation of Calvary Mm -hmm. and I can participate in that sacrifice and in communion with him. And it just gives it this moment of weight to me that it's always been a very powerful thing for me. I don't know if that's for everybody, but it works for me. Well, no. Yeah. And it's, 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 uh, it's very similar to what I do in sort of preparing, like, what am I taking to the altar at the beginning? Right. Mm -hmm. It's like all that stuff you're talking about as you're walking up, I've already laid it there and I'm like, do your thing, Jesus, you know, Mm -hmm. what about after communion? Like I'm a very distracted person. Um, and so when I receive communion, I, I literally like close my eyes because I, I just I kind of my mind will wander mm-hmm. in the presence of God inside of me. I'm just like it, the anime of, Christy for for a long time. For a long time, I was always of the mindset that I go back to my pew and I sit in silence and I really appreciate the moment until Monsignor Brennan really spoke to our community at, at seminary. <clears throat> And, you know, there is a communal hymn being sung. This is a communal mm. action. Yeah. Jesus is in communion with all of us. And it does merit in a full yeah. active and con- conscious participation of the liturgy to participate in the hymn. Yeah. And then what the liturgy calls for is at the conclusion of the hymn to exercise a, a moment of silence and to sit there silently and to pray. Mm. And, you know, if, if there's a devotion that you want to do, um, that's fine. Um, one of my favorites is the Anima Christi. Yeah. As you mentioned, you know, the there's a post-reflection hymn that, um, a post-communion reflection hymn that a, a friend of mine, Colleen Nixon, sings, and it's the Anima Christi. She's, uh, she, she's a, yeah, she's a recording artist, right? She's a recording yeah, artist. she's really good. I've seen and her in uh, That Instagram. Anima Christi is beautiful. Is she she sang it at my ordination. Is she Father Nixon's sister? Cousin. Cousin? Yeah. I well, no, so. no, excuse me. <laughs> no, sister-in-law. 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 Sorry, cousin. cousin. Yeah. So she married Ty. You're from Jacksonville. Yeah, excuse you not understanding <laughs> that that's distinction. That's terrible. That's <laughs> terrible. So, no, like, you know, I think I think that's appropriate. Um, a post-reflection, uh, commu- you know, him, where you could just really meditate on the words that are being sung. That's beautiful. And then let us pray. Mm-hmm. And, you know, then the prayer... And then the final blessing and commissioning, you know, to wait for that final blessing, to wait for that final prayer after communion that we all pray and then receive the blessing of the priest 
and go and announce the gospel of the Lord. You have received this now. Now go, you know, and announce the communion that you have with your brothers and sisters and with your God. Uh, and and that that <clears throat> changes everything. Absolutely. Yeah, you're, I mean, you're transformed there, mm-hmm. you know. And I then, always feel really close to God after yeah. communion. It's like you're being, you're being, you're being purposed with yeah. a mission. Yeah. Somebody You've gotten said, what you should from Mass, now mm-hmm. you're commanded to go give it. Yeah, yeah you're, you're a vessel, and, you know, hopefully you've had the chance to be contrite and, and go to confession and bring things to him and, and have that renewal. But you're, you're a vessel that carries Christ into the world, and, you know, you, it's to be seen. It's to be witnessed. It's to mm-hmm. be, you know, poured out into the, the world that we live in, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah. What, what would you say about— um, the devotion of a daily mass for somebody who's struggling with mass to kind of practice if they can during the week, because like I, sometimes I find it, uh, I find that I'm a a lot more, uh, focused if I, if I go to a mass during the week, Mm -hmm. like one, one on Wednesday or one on Tuesday or one on Thursday, or maybe if I can hit a couple during the week, like how do you, how do you talk to people spiritually about maybe increasing their devotion, uh, or, or increasing their attendance at mass Mm -hmm. as as a spiritual, Mm -hmm. you know, tool. There is no question if you start participating in the calendar of the church and you're participating in daily liturgy, you will be so much more prepared and receptive to the overall procession and the overall offering that God is placing in his church and how he's feeding and nourishing and nurturing his children, you know, in his church. That is absolutely evident. I don't know where I personally would be without yeah. that appreciation for daily liturgy or the liturgy of the hours the liturgy, and that's what i mean by daily liturgy like the liturgy of the hours as well like to have this liturgical sense of participating deeply in the mystery because i'm being immersed in the mystery every single day yeah you're really good at praying your hours and you're going to draw you're going to draw you're going to draw things out of that that's very very helpful and cathartic mm-hmm. and it, we we get struggles all the time it, for me, you know, thing, oppressive things hit me sometimes, all different types of darkness. And the word in the liturgy and the scriptures and the mass help alleviate all of that stuff. Mm-hmm. It gives me such a sense of, ah, oh, thank you, God. Yeah. One more thing I'd recommend, you know, af- before, you know, after that commission, but before you hightail it for your car and mm-hmm. to go break that fast, um, Saying the St. Michael prayer after Mass, that was the tradition of the church for a long time, mm-hmm. and you're, you're still allowed to do it. And I would just say, you know, don't be in such a rush to get out of the church that you can't take, what is it, 30 seconds to mm-hmm. say that prayer mm-hmm. and really invoke that protection of, you know, St. Michael, the protector and the, you know, archangel. Um, the mad dash after yeah. church. Yeah. Yeah. Say, yeah. say yeah. some prayers for the, for the Holy Father. Uh, say the... St. Michael prayer, say some additional prayers. I mean, you're already there. He got, yeah. You got another two minutes, three minutes to spare. Get the most out of that time and say those prayers and, and really start to find what prayers are going to help you in that commission to really take this stuff, protect it, and bring it out with you. So important. I love praying that prayer. Yep. Absolutely. Well, we thank you so much for joining us in this most recent episode of the Catholic Talk Show. Again, we were on all of our social, all of the social media channels, Facebook, Instagram, as well as Twitter. So be sure to follow us on there. And if you are viewing our content on YouTube, be sure to subscribe and click the bell so that whenever we produce a new video, it shows up in your feed. We want to give a big thank you to all of our patrons who support us financially through patreon.com forward slash the Catholic Talk Show. Your generosity helps us move the show into new markets and new fields. And we appreciate your support because we've really grown tremendously in, in, in our reach and our show. And, uh, you know, for this next week, why don't you enter into Mass and try to employ some of these new fasts, maybe these new intentions, maybe maybe like really review some of the scriptures before the weekend and see what that does for you. And I assure you, the more that you put in, the more you're going to get out. And what you can get out is the essence of joy. And man, does our world need to see that joy and feel that joy, the joy of communion with one another and our God who loves us. We'll see you next week. Mm-hmm.